Hey everyone, I am Dr. Holly Lucille, a naturopathic doctor, and on behalf of Fullscript, I welcome you. I am a senior medical advisor there, and I was also, before I became a uh, naturopathic doctor, I actually found out about naturopathic medicine through the American Holistic Nursing Association, which I found after I got my undergrad with a bachelor's degree in nursing, and so I'm super excited to be here. This content is amazing. I want to bring on our very special guest. I want to introduce Dr. Lara Zakaria. She is an integrative pharmacist, a nutritionist, a professor, a public health professional specializing in functional medicine. We are so happy to have her here. So Lara, tell me about a little bit about yourself and the topic that we're going to be talking about today, because my parents are, um, or were, I should say, both pharmacists, but certainly not the kind of pharmacist that you are. So take it away. Well, thank you so much, Holly. And first of all, what a cool combination of the heart and compassion of healthcare, honestly, of the nursing profession combined with naturopathic medicine. And it's such an honor to be talking to uh, nurse practitioners about this topic. So yeah, I am a combination of a pharmacist and a nutritionist. I got really into functional medicine as I was working community pharmacy. And I realized I really, really love the aspect of nutrition and how we can use nutrition to really optimize our health. So I started to dig around, learn around about that. And I'm a nerd by nature and decided to go back to school, get my master's in nutrition. And I really dove in head first to understanding how nutrients, food, the food, the way it comes, uh, you know, naturally the way that we eat it and the way that it it comes in the natural food matrix, as well as how herbs impact our body and our health. And Amazing. I, uh, yes, it is absolutely fascinating. And I, and I feel like we get to this point where for a long time, I thought, you know, the, the optimum, you know, health would not require medication, right? But then I realized that very often medications aren't going to be a question, right? They're going to be needed, whether it be for acute or for chronic care. And instead, why don't we think about merging these two things together? Let's think about how we can optimize our health using both. When needed, we use pharmaceuticals safely and we optimize nutrition with that along the way. So I'd encourage you to just help me make this pharmaconutrition phrase a thing. So is, th is that your word? Did you come up with I made it up. I totally oh, made it up. God. Yeah. <laughs> It's so amazing. And, you know, I always say, you know, when I'm talking to people and we're talking about dietary supplements or supplements, and I really make it clear that, look, it's not just, you know, things that you can actually get on full script or in a couple aisles in your local health food store. These are nutrients that drive our biochemistry. And yes, they are included in food, but now we have evidence and data, you know, at correct dosages that make, can make a huge difference in combining that type of nutrition with pharmacy because there are interactions and I know we're going to talk about that. And I agree with you. I always say there is a place for everything, right? Yeah. There is a place for everything. There's a value in all systems of medicine and a place for everything. So excellent. Can't wait. Absolutely. And, and look, the reality is I, I'm not blind to the fact that side effects, drug interactions, adverse drug reactions, not only cost us money in terms of the healthcare system, but they also cost us our health. They, they, they chip away at what could be potentially optimal health. And so it, this is a huge opportunity, in my opinion, right? We can look at this problem and we can say, okay, well, it is what it is. You know, the problem is the medication. Well, yeah, to a certain extent there is. And we have an army of pharmacists who can get really good at figuring out which medications should be used when safely, the right dose in the right person for the right length of time, right? But why don't we then flip that around and say, okay, are there nutrient interactions? Are there drug-induced nutrient depletions that we can close those gaps on, right? What about if some of those side effects are caused by some of those interactions or depletions? What if we're not gaining optimal potency of a medication because we're not maximizing on a particular nutri uh, nutritional pathway. What if we actually looked at herbs and nutrients to help us synergize the medication, actually make it work better because we're doubling down on an effectiveness of a pathway, I right? Love it. And then we do that within the context of safely evaluating for potential interactions with either herbs or nutrients. 
such a huge topic and so important for anybody that is one, able to prescribe medication and two, knowing that the people that they're caring for are on herbs, right? Yeah. Whether they tell them or not yes. and dietary supplements. And so absolutely. did you know 40% of individuals, this is coming from a uh, study that I read recently, 40% of individuals surveyed don't tell their clinician that they're on a supplement, 40%. And they often cite the fact that they don't think their, their uh, healthcare provider will be able to answer questions about it or that they'll feel judged for taking it. Yeah. And I think when you're a nutraceutical savvy practitioner, you are furthering that trust and building that conversation with people. They're going to take supplements. They're taking supplements. Yeah. So we need to make sure that they're doing it safely. And you know, I think it's an important point that you bring up too, because when we're caring for people, no matter who we are, as long as we keep that person and their best interest in our minds, then we should be open to anything. There's a lot of times people come to me and I am not clear on something, but it's something that's in their care plan from their team, I'm gonna go look it up and take responsibility for it so I can at least be knowledgeable and supportive to the individual that we're caring for. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, let's talk about you know some of that exact point. How are we gonna be knowledgeable? What let's, let's set a foundation of the potential interactions, right? I, I call this the hit parade. Most of us that had pharmacology classes, probably familiar with some of these nutrient interactions, food interactions, right? And, you know, for example, you don't want to use dairy products with certain uh, antibiotics, for example, right. or everybody knows levothyroxine is a diva. You can't take levothyroxine with anything else for like hours, right? Hours, so we, right. we, we, we know up, that, right? Set your alarm and take your thyroid medication it, ex and you'll be fine. Exactly, right? We know that that's drilled into our head. We know vitamin K and warfarin, classic interaction, right? Because yeah. warfarin uses that vitamin K pathway to have its anticoagulant effect, right? Uh, MAOIs, if you are prescribing them, you know, you, yeah. you know, tyramine foods, uh, grapefruit uses that CYP4 pathway system that interacts with a lot of medications. So can either, uh, deplete pro drugs and re reduce the effectiveness of those medications or can increase their, um, uh, metabolism. So reduce their effectiveness. So nice. these are, I think these are pretty classic examples kind of getting us all comfortable and, and refreshing our memories a little bit. But I nice. want to remind everybody that there's actually a bi-directional relationship between the drugs that we take in and the foods that we eat and vice versa. There is a ton, right? This is like a lot of words on this slide. There is a ton of factors that are going to influence and impact not only the way the medication works, but your need for those nutrients yeah. and then how those nutrients are going to impact the drug. So it's not this simple, if this, then that. There is a little bit more to this interaction, this conversation between nutrients. I, you know, I love that you're highlighting the synergy because, you know, we are aware, especially of the older ones that you just mentioned of drug nutrient interactions, but you're bringing up a whole nother level of this combination because it actually can be used for good. It can yeah. be used to have the drug maybe more effective, therefore not a side effect and then not another drug and also maybe a lower dose of that drug or a shorter usage of time. Absolutely. Can I show you something really cool, Holly? Please. Actually, now that you said that, um, I just found this study. I was at a conference and I heard about the study and I was like, how cool is this? So we all know that statins don't work for everybody in terms of reducing mortality risk or hospitalization risks, right? And this study actually looked at the impact of the microbiome, not just how the statins change the microbiome, that's one thing to explore, but rather how does the microbiome impact the outcome of the statins? And they found that there was actually a difference in the microbiome that would impact whether or not that statin was effective in that individual. Preliminary research, we still need to look at it further and deeper, but this is yet another level of interactions that we have to think about, the metabolomics that are happening as a result of our bio-individual differences when it comes Excellent. to our microbiome. This is holism in like in in prime time. Amazing. Absolutely. So one of the hot topics is thinking about drug-induced nutrient depletions, right? So drug-induced nutrient depletions, you'll hear me say DIND is as the name 
kind of describes, it's when we are impairing, blocking, or changing the way a nutrient is metabolized, absorbed, or used in the body as a result of the presence of a medication. And sometimes it's direct, sometimes it's indirect. Well, kind of get to that in a second. But this is the part where we got to put our clinical thinking caps on, right? Yes. It's a little bit more of an art than a science. And we right. have to really evaluate not only what this literature says, but the bio-individual differences are going to impact that person's DIND. That's right. Because as you said, medications are sometimes needed. And then we need these nutrients to drive our biochemistry. If you've ever taken a nutrition class, and you have many of them as a nutritionist, it's like taking a biochemistry class and vice versa, right? Exactly. exactly. And so if a medication is placed on board for a clinical purpose and to have an outcome and there's nutrient interactions, then another part of the body is going to be affected. Exactly. And this is, you know, you, you kind of said that, you summarized it perfectly, right? Somebody gets a set of symptoms. Their lab findings suggest that there's something wrong, right? You go to the doctor, doctor or the nurse practitioner or the physician's assistant prescribes that medication, checks all the boxes. It's a correct diagnosis. They give them the correct medication. They get started. That person is compliant. They take their medication consistently. Fantastic. The original set of symptoms might eventually be addressed, right? But then under the hood, insidiously, you might start to see some other, some of these nutrient depletions start to occur, right? Those nutrient depletions might come up with their own set of symptoms or their own set of signs or laboratory findings. Uh -oh, now and your, then the patient becomes a whack-a-mole game. Exactly. You go back and you go, hmm, I wonder what's up. Okay, well, let's try this new medication, right? And the cycle continues to your point. I love that whack-a-mole because now you're just sort of whacking at the symptoms. Exactly. Exactly. So maybe that was a, that was the absolute perfect medication to start them on in the beginning. But had we addressed some of those drug induced nutrient depletions, we may not have experienced that second set of symptoms. It's not always that perfect, but that's sort of what we're trying to at least address foundationally. Right. right? And I think part of the issue is we've been taught that, nutrition is either, you know, on or off, right? You're either fully repleted or not fully repleted, but it actually sits on a spectrum where we often think of outright deficiency. And most of our laboratory evaluations at this time look for just outright nutrition deficiency, where we're probably more on a continuum somewhere in insufficiency. And what we want to get to is optimal function. And that right. optimal function is going to be different for each person, right? Your it's, genetics, yeah. your needs, those are going to, there's going to dictate what optimal means. It's like that person that comes in lab, laboratories and hands their doctor who they've seen before, everything is fine. And then I look yep. at their vitamin D level, just for example, and they're one click above rickets. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> you're in, you're in the normal range, but you know, technically, you're technically you're not deficient, but you're not optimal. That's perfect. Right. Yes. Great example. And, and so there, what are the factors? Why would some people be uh, experiencing a set of these side effects as a result of DIND and sure. others don't. Well, number one, how many medications are there on? Is there is there a duplication of some of these deficiencies that might be contributing to it? Uh, are they elderly, right? In, in, our, in the elderly and geriat geriatric populations, we have altered pharmacokinetics, and that's going to impact the way their body metabolizes not only the medication, but their nutritional needs as well and how they absorb those nutrients from their diet. We also might have initially started out on a poor diet, right? They might not be eating very healthfully to begin with. And they might have chronic health conditions, metabolic disorders, physiologic, uh, increased physiolo physiologic demand due to those chronic conditions. And that's going to change, again, what their starting line is. And when you think about that, so there's like the biological factors, right? How much activity they do, um, you know, whether or not they're healing from an injury or surgery, or maybe they have psychological trauma. If there are um, absorption issues, what does their digestion look like? What their microbiome looks like? What are their initial genetics? Do they have genetic SNPs that require that they have more of certain nutrients, right? And then there's other factors. The medication we're on, of course, whether or not some of those medications might interact or cause other absorption issues? Uh, what's their diet quality look like? Are they consistently able to eat a high quality, high nutrient dense diet? Do they have environmental exposures, toxic exposures, things like that, that we have to consider? And what's their geographic location? You mentioned the vitamin D, Holly. What if you live like me in the Northeast right. and like three quarters of the year, I'm bundled up and I don't see the sun, right? So I'm probably going to have to be more mindful of my vitamin D level than somebody that lives in sunny LA. But you know what? I have to tell you something. Because I, I, I don't, so, okay, 
all right, long story, but I'm going to make it really short. Yeah. So my vitamin D level dropped and my practitioner was asking and I said, you know what? And I'm going to, this is a true story. It, it was a hot summer. So yes. I really didn't get outside enough. You think yes. about it, it, do. it can go that way. And it did That's for me. That's such a good point. Right? And for the genetics, I have low circulating vitamin D due to my genes and low circulating vitamin C due to my genes. And yes. so it happens all the time. And I'll add, you know, there are other factors that will impact that. If you have darker skin pigmentation, right? Yeah. If you dress modestly, right? And you're even if you're outside and you're covered up, you're not going to get as much vitamin D from sun exposure, right? So there are definitely other factors. There are genetic factors as well. Some people have VDR SNPs that impact their vitamin D levels as well. Your magnesium level will impact your vitamin D level, right? So there are all these various factors. And the point is that we want to consider all these influences when we think about those drug-induced nutrient depletions. Yeah, great. So let's get into the little mechanisms. I I'm, I'm just want to give some, I want to give you a few examples just so that we can solidify what we're learning here. So for example, PPIs, we know are meprazoles, right? Our um, Prilosex, et cetera. These are going to inhibit the nutritional absorption specifically for PPIs, for example, magnesium, calcium, folate, oh, those are big ones for, for that one. Um, we can also inhibit nutritional synthesis. So an example of that would be statins and the classic CoQ10 depletion. Right. Another example would be metformin, which actually uh, blocks the absorption of vitamin D. So the mechanism there would be like blocking the actual absorption, shifting that mechanism. Uh, an increase uh, of me metabolism of certain nutrients or changing our need for certain nutrients. Estrogens, actually, folks that are in HRT in particular, we know that they have an increased uh, demand for B vitamins, particularly mm -hmm. B12 and folic acid. And we, another mechanism would be increased excretion. We know this one, right? ACE inhibitors, for example, that increase the excretion of certain minerals. And then we have alterations in the body's ability to store a nutrient. And I put caffeine and alcohol in here as, as an example. We all know, you know, I drink my coffee half an hour later, you know, got to go, right? So these your are- Your morning the beverage and your evening beverage. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, which is why, I mean, I'm sure we all counsel the same way when we're talking about hydration, we're talking about, hey, if it's caffeinated or it has alcohol in it, it's going to cause uh, um, increased urination. With that increased urination, you're going to lose some electrolytes, right? So, mm. Excellent point. So just to put, you know, a bow on the DINDs, I just want to remind everybody there are databases uh, that we can utilize. And I'll give you some of those references at the end yeah. that you can use to, to sort of start wrapping your head around this. But remember, these are not studied as extensively. And I want to encourage everybody to join me in asking for more of this kind of a research, because we really do need more of this evidence to help us drive better clinical decisions. In the meanwhile, I want you to keep in mind it's bio-individual. Just because something is supposed to be depleted doesn't always mean it is, right? And just because something, something isn't as depleted in the literature doesn't mean that individual doesn't need more attention on that nutrient. So we got to put our, our clinical thinking caps on. We've got it. This is where the art of the drug-induced nutrient depletion and drug, drug nutrient interactions comes in. And we want to make sure that we are screening our patients, doing our due diligence before we make any assumptions. I think this is such a great topic and such a great point because, you know, I'll just, you know, in school, in naturopathic medical school, yes, I had to take pharmacology all of the mm -hmm. time. And mm -hmm. you're like, well, why? I'm not really going to be prescribing a whole heck of a lot. Why? Because I need to know these things, right? I need to know these interactions because they're going to make a difference in your patient's clinical condition. And so this awareness, I just, it's, it, I think it's just so tremendously important. I couldn't agree more, Holly. And I think this is the part where, again, I think everybody should have a basic foundational knowledge in it, whether or not in your practice, you're prescribing a lot. I think knowing that um, is really helpful for understanding and serving your whole community, right? Whether or not they need to be on the medication or not. And if you're not, we can't know everything, right? This is where collaboration and partnership really comes in handy, right? Reaching into your network, finding other providers that are aligned, that understand these factors, and you can work together. So if you are maybe a clinician that doesn't prescribe as much, right? Maybe that's where having a pharmacist that is nutraceutical savvy, that understands these interactions and can help, you know, guide you when it comes to those specific protocols. Or maybe you are in a community where you do prescribe a lot, right? That's a cornerstone and it's needed in order to help best manage and care for your patients. Fantastic. 
And maybe the, maybe you're needing somebody to help you on the nutraceutical end. Fantastic. Work with a naturopathic doctor and nutrition savvy pharmacist and nutritionist, right? Let's work together as a team and really provide holistic care. I love that. And you're going to get into drug herb interactions because to your point, 40% of people pretty much close to the chest as far as what they're taking and what you're saying about getting some help or pulling in somebody. Like for me, I always say, get help with things that you're not sure of. Like, right. Bookkeeping for me, forget about it. I hired somebody to help me with that. Right. So, but also it gets my job as a naturopathic doctor to understand these medications that somebody are on. I would say the same thing with somebody who's not as familiar with herbs, instead of saying, I don't know, please don't take it. Yes. There's tons of us out there that do know, and we can work together to make healthcare better in America. Absolutely. It's not going anywhere. Nope. In 2020, consumers spent 11 billion with a B dollars on supplements. By 2021, they outgrew their projections and it's predicted that by 2025, it's going to grow another 10 billion, right? With a B. With a B, girl, like this is not going anywhere, right? People are interested in nutraceuticals. They're interested in supplementation. So for us to put our head in the sand because it wasn't something that we were taught in school, it's not doing our community and our patients a service, right? Mm -hmm. And the reality is at least 30% of individuals, and to be honest, these are numbers from 2021. It's probably gone up since then. Um, But 30% of Americans are taking at least one herbal supplement. 25% are also taking medication, right? But 40% don't actually tell their doctor or their prescriber, their nurse practitioner, their PA, their pharmacist, they're not telling us that they're on a nutraceutical. And again, they're, you know, we we need to make sure we're establishing trust that we are learning what we need to learn so that we can build that communication with them. Excellent. 100%. So again, we talked about that bi-directional relationship when it comes to uh, nutrients. The same thing happens with herbal interactions as well, right? There's multiple mechanisms that will impact the way that an herb is metabolized. Similar to drugs, they actually go through the same pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamics in order to be utilized by the body. So we're utilizing the P450 enzymatic system, which is our phase one detoxification pathway. We're utilizing glucuronidase pathways. We're utilizing phase two pathways. We're also utilizing and impacting the drug transporters and drug efflux pathways. Sometimes we call those phase three uh, metabolism, but these are going to both impact the way that the drug is metabolized and the drug vice versa is going to impact the way that herb is going to interact as well. You know, I, part of my practice is I work with integrative oncology in integrative oncology and people who have been diagnosed with patterns of cancering, um, in standard of care, there's going to be medications, drugs, chemotherapy agents, et cetera. I use a database. I'm going to wait for you to get to those um, because I need to make sure and understand those pathways because right And to your point too, there's also contraindications with herbs that I need to understand about, but there's optimizers, right? There's optimizers where, Hey, can we use less of the drugs, less of the chemotherapy, right? You know, stem cells then. Um, And so it's just a fascinating field. And I'm so happy you have your fingers on the pulse of it. Absolutely. And again, I just want to repeat myself from earlier. I really want to make sure that we're all echoing and asking for more (laughs) research in this field because we just don't have a lot. There's not a lot of incentive to research these interactions at this time. So we do have some good, you know, data out there and we're doing the best that we can. There are databases that help us to identify where the weight of the evidence should be. But the reality is we still need more in order to make the right clinical decisions. The reality is because we don't have a lot of data, the data that we do have tends to also be skewed towards bias. It's looking for the risk factor of the interaction and not necessarily always looking for the opportunity for synergy. So that's number one. The other piece of it, sometimes it's um, in vitro instead of in vivo. So we all know that animal studies don't always translate to clinical application and very often they're case studies. So we all know on the spectrum of the strength of evidence, those aren't the strongest for us to use again for clinical application. And so we really want to make sure that, again, that we're thinking about that as we're evaluating the data and those interactions. And again, it's an art 
And we've got to put our clinical thinking caps on and think about those and evaluate those. So think about how it could be metabol altering metabolism. We want to think about how it could be changing the way we're absorbing or metabolizing something or, or uh, absorbing or potentially blocking absorption of something. Is it changing GI function? Is it slowing things down or speeding things up that's altering also either nutrient absorption or drug absorption? Is it changing hepatic or renal clearance? Or is there potential for a synergy is there an additive effect we can either take advantage of, or is there an antagonistic effect, both from a therapeutic perspective, as well as an adverse drug reaction perspective as well? Yeah. So more research and more awareness. Absolutely. What we're doing right here. Um, so St. John's Wort, I don't know about you, Holly, tell me, how many times were you warned that this was like the biggest drug interaction, herb, avoid it, you know, good could come of it, right? Like, I have, I, I have, I see it in my dreams, to be honest with you. I, right, I, it's so, <laughs> yes. yeah, so if, if folks aren't familiar with St. John's Wort, it's often used as an antidepressant. It has very similar action to SSRIs in that it helps to increase serotonin availability, which helps alleviate depression and anxiety it can be helpful for sleep. Um, however, because it relies on the CYP450 system, it actually reduces uh, uh, the bioavailability of certain drugs by 80%, alters, I should say, the availability of certain drugs by about up to 80%. That's pretty significant, which means it's also going to not only interact with a lot of medication, but it's going to potentially reduce the concentrations of those medications, mm. meaning they're not going to be as effective, Right. But it might also, in the case of pro-drugs, it might cause toxicity because it's not going to allow that drug to properly metabolize to its active form. So there could be too much or too little. So I'll give you an example. Um, antidepressants, right? Antidepressants share a mechanism of action. I just explained that this increases the amount of serotonin. If you're already on an SSRI, what do we know? An overdose of an SSRI might lead to serotonin syndrome, right? So taking the St. John's Wort along with an SSRI has this additive effect where you might actually have an adverse reaction with too much serotonin, right? Then I combine that with an oral contraceptive where we increase the metabolism of that oral contraceptive. What do we have? The failure of the contraceptive, right? So it depends on the medication. Got it. But what if I told you, and this is one study looking at the potential interaction. It was a review actually looking at the various studies. And we look at St. John's Wort. And at best, we have good evidence, and actually, we only have fair evidence mm. looking at the other classes of medication. So now I've got to put that clinical thinking hat on, and I got to go, okay, well, an SSRI with a St. John's wort, I have options. I have other herbs and nutrients that I can use. There's no reason for me to double down on that pathway right. and risk a potential interaction, even if the evidence is fair. It's just not, that's not good prescribing, Right. But an oral contraceptive, not only is that slightly stronger evidence that there's an interaction there, I also don't want to take a chance with it, right? So I'm going to skip it. But the statin, moderate interaction, fair level of evidence, you know, you might think, okay, maybe the St. John's wort makes sense in this case. Based on the need, could. Based on the need, you could. Again, could I use other alternatives? Absolutely, I can. And I'm not advocating that you necessarily go ahead and use St. John's wort with every statin case. But I just want to sort of show where we have to evaluate the risk versus benefit in some cases. Got you. And to your point before, sometimes we can actually capitalize on these benefits. There are studies that looked at NSAIDs, for example, in combination with polyphenols like resveratrol or EGCG and have found that you can actually potentially reduce the need for the NSAID as well as reduce the uh, side effect of gastric bleeding by mm. using them in combination with things like resveratrol, EGCG, or turmeric, right? Um, in one study, they actually found that not only did they reduce the pain, they actually reduced the markers for inflammation like CRP and the interleukin markers that proved that it actually reduced inflammation across the board. That's, I mean, and, and we all know the benefits of NSAIDs, but also the detrimental side effects. And so again, if you can use less of the drug, and then as you said, increase uh, anti-inflammation across the board, like systemically by combining these things, I mean, it's, a, it's just, it's a one plus one equals 10. 
It's, it's seriously a win, win, win situation. Absolutely. And I also think about, again, gaining more trust with the patients that we're working with, right? Really establishing an open communication where they can see that we're really working towards their best interests. So you've gone through so much, such a fascinating, important topic. So for for people that are listening right now, how can we actually just get to the clinical condition and really put that thinking cap on, as you say, and put this into practice? Like right now. We're going to use oral contraceptives as our example, and we're going to walk through the whole framework, starting with the decision-making about using the oral contraceptives, because that's where it always starts, the decision about using the medication, and then starting to check the boxes off for the various opportunities, as well as some of the interactions that we have to screen for, right? So... Why do we even think about using contraceptives? Well, number one, um, 25% of women are using oral contraceptives and they're choosing hormonal contraceptives. So it's about choice and options. Very often, they're not even using them for contraceptive reasons. 14% of women are using them to reduce symptoms or associated with things like PCOS, endometriosis, menstrual-related symptoms, right? Irregular bleeding. And we actually can use them not only to reduce some of the symptoms and side effects associated with menopause, but they actually have been shown Shown to be effective for reducing certain types of cancers. So again, we've got to think about, is it appropriate for us to even use this medication? That's the decision you make with your patient. We, of course, then design and choose the correct kind of oral contraceptive, right? Personalization starts right in the beginning. Which kind of oral contraceptive, hormonal or oral contraceptive are you going to use? Are you going to use a multiphasic, a monophasic? And then do we want to avoid withdrawal bleeding? Do we want to have monthly bleeding? every three months, once a year, what makes sense in this, in this individual. Now, once we've made that decision, we have to now consider the side effects, right? What are some of the adverse reactions? What are the risk factors? There are, this is not even the full list. This is just sort of the top concerns, cardiovascular risks, right? There are CNS and mood related risks. Women that are oral oral contraceptives often express issues with anxiety, increase of anxiety, depression, as well as migraines. There's GI related risks. And then there's other common, I I put a kind of a cluster of them, for example, allergic reactions, edema, et cetera. So again, weighing the pros and the cons, we all know this, right? We're prescribers. We all understand that when it comes to this question, we have to weigh the pros and the cons with each other. Risk benefit ratio is always there. Exactly. So now the first step, we have decided she wants to start the oral contraceptive. They want to start the oral contraceptive. We have decided, okay, great. What's the first thing I'm going to do? I want you to start thinking about where the drug-induced nutrient depletions, right? So here's what we know from the literature. We know the most significant that the literature recommends that we replete our folate and magnesium. Folate makes sense, Right. Yep. We know that most women who are going to be on an oral contraceptive makes sense for us to make sure that folate is in check. Magnesium is used in like, I don't know, 300 different enzymatic reactions in the body. So making sure that it's repleted also really makes just prudent sense. And most the people need it one anyway. Deficient nutrient in Ex- the United States. Exactly. Vitamin D might be vying for that spot, but yes, absolutely a huge need for magnesium anyway. So it makes sense. From there, we've got some good evidence that shows that certain B vitamins, B1, B6, B12, as well as vitamin C and zinc, that there is evidence of depletion. However, the literature doesn't strongly say you have to replete this. You have to take these specifically. But what I would do as a clinician is I would monitor those and that's easy enough to do. And then the least significant, these are, we're going to keep our eye what the literature says about them, but calcium, copper, iron, and vitamin A, those, there is no current uh, recommendations for repleting them. However, again, just prudent to kind of keep an eye and make sure that we're closing those gaps when needed. Now, the next thing I want you to start thinking about is the microbiome, right? And so I'm going to introduce the term estrabolome. If you haven't heard it before, it's, it's the specific term for the microbiome that is responsible for metabolizing our estrogens, right? And within that uh, microbiome, we produce something called beta-glucuronidase, and that beta-glucuronidase is part of that metabolic process, right? 
we also need to consider how much oral contraceptives and uh, or HRT will impact this estrobilome because that's its primary role is to metabolize those estrogens. Well, the literature is not clear about whether or not oral contraceptives, hormonal oral contraceptives will have a huge impact on the estrobilome. However, the estrobilome will have an impact on those oral contraceptives. The other piece is that the amount of sex hormone binding globulin, which uh. is responsible for transporting hor the estrogen hormone, the beta glucuronidase, which is responsible for detoxifying or metabolize metabolizing estrogens, the liver function, which is responsible for metabolism in general, as well as that iron regulation, and something called TMAO, which is a byproduct of microbial metabolism, which is highly associated with metabolic diseases like diabetes and kidney disease. All of these have to be considered. We can't just look at one change in the microbiome. And those have been shown to be impacted to some degree in women. Again, research, more research is needed. But this makes me go, you know what? We all need to think about our gut microbiome. So we might as well make sure that we're prudently uh, checking for this and making sure that digestion, gut health, and um, the integrity of the, the gut is being addressed. I mean, it's such a great point. I've got a practitioner, a friend of mine who, um, it's, it's his jam, is age management and hormones and such. And um, we, had, we were having a conversation the other day and he's like, you know, I draw blood on these people and I'm, they're on like estrogen, but I'm like, are they taking it? Are they taking it? I'm like, they're not taking it. To the point, right? You can monitor from a serum level or what have you, but if there's so much stuff going on underneath the hood that we're not aware of. Yeah. So I love that you keep saying we need to be together in asking for more research, but I love that you're also bringing such great awareness to our clinical picture because um, it's going to decrease adverse side effects from, you know, and increase better outcomes across the board. Agreed. Agreed. And it's going to just make it safer. We're going to feel better when we are prescribing those medications because we know that- it. Yes, absolutely. So from there, what do you do? Okay, Lara, what do we do now that I know all this? What am I going to do moving forward? Well, we're going to first start with a basic nutritional foundation. We're going to have conversations when it comes to diet. We're going to assess their diet quality. We're going to look at those foundational pieces and make sure we're there. And if we're not trained in that, we're going to partner with a nutritionist that can help us with that, right? We're going to evaluate their cardiometabolic risk because there are increased risk. It's an increased risk factor for them, right? Particularly if they have either genetics or family history that would really make us want to pay attention to that. We want to evaluate their GI. Do they have a uh, majority of people who complain of IBS are, are women and Many women complain of GI issues or taking oral contraceptives. So it makes sense for us to consider that. There's also a large overlap between GI symptoms and IBS with mental health, mood, anxiety, depression, right? So it makes sense for us to be paying attention how well their GI is functioning. And again, because of that metabolic piece uh, in terms of how the microbiome is acting and how that impacts oral contraceptives, it makes sense, right? We're going to check on their stress and their HPA access, right? We're going to make sure that we're addressing those foundational pieces. A lot of our neurotransmitters are actually produced in our GI and our, again, our microbiome will impact that quality of those neurotransmitters transmitters as well. And then last but not least, I just wanted to remind us all that we should be screening for mm. androgen dominance or PCOS. Many, many women go undiagnosed because it's not screened closely enough. And so I just want to make sure that we're addressing that picture because very often oral contraceptives can hide that symptom. And very often it's used to address the symptoms of PCOS. But remember, PCOS lives on a metabolic spectrum. So we need to be addressing it from its root. Nice. All right. So why are we going to get in there and we're going to get our therapeutic approach down? Number one, you know, kind of Refreshing our memory from before, remember the folate and the magnesium right. is going to be an important starting point, right? Just I feel like we're talking about basically looking at oral contraceptives. This is yes, one this is specifically, example. yeah, one example. We're just looking, this is the foundations when it comes to our drug uh, nutrient repletions when it comes to oral hormonal oral contraceptives. So number one, our targeted approach is going to include folate and magnesium. That just goes without saying. I'm also thinking about those B complex, those minerals that we talked about earlier. And then there's a category where I called targeted, right? Mm. If we need them, we would use, for example, an iron. And I like the bisglycinate form because that's better for absorption, less GI symptoms, et cetera. And 
If needed, if we need a calcium, I would use a buffered calcium for improved absorption or a calcium deglucurate. If you notice that there is a detoxification issue, we can actually screen that on a stool test and see if there's actually a need to increase glucuronidation. That's a phase two metabolism piece that's important for estrogen balance. Glucuronidase is too elevated. Exactly. Exactly. So I, a, a note on the little pearl for you that on the iron deficiency. So very common, particularly in menstruating women, women who are at their increased risk because they're bleeding every month and potentially losing some iron. Um, there's also, of course, uh, genetic factors that can impact iron need. And very often I find clinicians are not fully screening for iron deficiency. We just do a basic CBC and differentials, and we're not doing that added step of looking at complete iron panels. Right. And, or at least at a ferritin. And I really encourage you to make that a regular part of your screening because iron is such a foundational nutrient it's needed for so many pieces of the metabolic picture that it just makes sense for us to uh, cheaply, easily check that full iron panel. From there, if you notice that there is a deficiency, again, the bisglycinate is my preferred form. It does have, in my experience and in the research, less side effects. It's better absorbed so you get better circulating levels. And here's another pro tip. Every other day dosing has been shown to actually improve iron oh. levels because the hepcidin protein, which is responsible for pulling in the iron, it increases for 48 hours. So every time you, and, and it blocks absorption. So if you skip a day, it allows for optimal absorption via that protein. Perfect. Exi- never heard of that, but it makes sense. Every other day dosing. I know. And I've seen it work in my clinic. So I'm curious if anybody tries it, let me know if you see it yeah. working. And I've got a couple of other trips on iron, but we could do a whole other talk about iron another yeah. day. <laughs> um, and then the other piece, we want to turn up that GI support. We want to think about using, whether it be probiotics or prebiotics, I lean towards using prebiotics whenever possible. I might use probiotics for short bursts of time or for therapeutic uses, but I like prebiotics better because the literature shows that they're more sustainable. The changes that happen to the microbiome are more balanced rather than being targeted. They sort of hit all the keystone species and they allow them to uh, grow and become more abundant in balance to each other. And the the effects last longer. They're more sustainable. And then the other piece of that is considering polyphenols, both from the diet or that could be from supplements as well if needed. And then what we know is that this whole picture all plays together. When we turn up the GI support, whether it be by prebiotics, whether it be through food, increasing fiber intake, encouraging folks to eat the rainbow, adding more polyphenols into the diet that helps to improve the gut function, which then translates to reduced inflammation. It translates to improved metabolic function. It translates to better neuro. GI, the GI, the gut brain access improves, mood improves, right? HPA mm-hmm. access improves. So it is a win-win situation for us to really think about that first and foremost. And then from there, I, I mean, I don't know anybody who's not stressed. <laughs> Right. So thinking about that HPA access, um, I think about adaptogens all the time. And I think about how we can support better support that HPA access. Ashwagandha is usually my go to in that case. Mm -hmm. You can think about things like 5-HTP or GABA. Those can also help with mood as well as for anxiety, as well as for sleep. And then last but not least, I just kind of final thought, the liver. Liver is an underappreciated organ. We think about it for detoxification. We talked a lot about the way we metabolize our drugs. Even our herbs go through phase one, phase two detoxification. Be careful. This is a lot of where we want to be cautious. If we we do too much or potentially there could be uh, drug herb interactions when it comes to liver support, you could metabolize the drug too fast, right? And we can lose the effect. So be careful. But remember, this is where iron homeostasis happens. This is where we make our uh, cholesterol, right? This is what controls our blood sugar, right? So very important for us to be thinking what's happening to that poor little liver in the background. Boy, this, you know, honestly, this takes my good old pharmacy parents uh, approach here, take this approach, like, and right out the window because there's so much more to think about. I mean, how, how often do you see or hear a story of somebody just, Oh, or a contraceptive, there you go. You write the script, it's done. And that's it. 
That's their healthcare. Super easy, right? Super, super, super easy, but comes yeah. with complications down the road. Absolutely. And, and this is what, you know, I think this is why this is so great. We're having this conversation. I've been talking to pharmacists, ones that are crossing over and coming into functional medicine. Those that are interested in nutrition and want to be able to close these gaps with you. So there are definitely pharmacists out there that are in the same boat. They're trying to also learn there. Some of them are actually more advanced in this and are also doing this research right alongside with me. So I got to shout out my pharmacist pharmacist profession, because we really are, you know, trying to address this. We're seeing it. We hear you. We're also out here advocating for even more research and we want to help you. So, you know, find us, <laughs> come talk to us, find us. We would love to collaborate with I nurse practitioners and have this conversation. Oh, yeah. Yes. Great. All right. So last thoughts, and then I'll share some of the, the resources that I lean on in order to start, you know, getting our, our toes wet here. Um, so number one, a, an education on all these mechanisms, just start getting comfortable reading some of the research, get some books under your belt. It'll help you with this conversation for sure. Remember, prioritize your patient outcomes, right? Limit your own bias. We've all been taught, every single one of us came out of our training, uh, you know, whether it was from nursing school, nurse practitioner programs, pharmacy school, um, maybe naturopathic, you guys were probably a little ahead of the game than us, but we all came out with this bias that, hey, avoid herbs. They're just, they're more, you know, they're more work than they're worth. Yeah. And I don't think that's true. I've actually right. seen herbs be really phenomenal in my patients and nutrient balance really can take it to the next level. So I encourage awesome. you to sort of open your mind up to the possibilities if this is new for you. Remember bio-individuality, environment, all that plays a role. Think about, um, you know, weigh the clinical significance, put that clinical critical thinking skill hat on, build those collaborations with other nutritionists, right? With other nutrition professionals, pharmacists, naturopathic doctors, medical doctors, other nurses and nurse practitioners. Let's build a team and collaborate because when we come together and we really start having these conversations, powerful things can happen for our patients and our communities. Excellent. And here are you, y'all will have all these resources. So I just want to share, here are some of the resources and databases that I use for DHI. Um, this is a study that I found particularly helpful and I still lean on it. It's from 2018, mm -hmm. um, but they have a lot of data and it's a, a review of all the potential data. And they have these great tables that really help us to sort of look at each individual potential um, drug-induced nutrient depletion. There's two great databases that I love. My Tavin is, is great, as is Natural Medicines, and they weigh the evidence so that tells you how heavily to weigh the, the clinical evidence and opportunities, which I think is really useful. And then we do have a resource on Fullscript that is available for you, which is the protocol that we've come up with. This is a great starting point, great foundational protocol. We really like kind of cleared out the noise and just got to what is going to set the foundation that's going to be most evidence-based. And I think it's really going to be helpful for the patients that you're serving that are on oral contraceptives. Yeah, this is one of the things that I love so much about Fullscript is that not only is it an incredible platform to automate your practice, but the amount of resources, especially when we get like, because like I said, here, take this approach. No longer. You can't watch this webinar and just prescribe. You've yeah. got to be able to think through things just a little bit further. And Fullscript is definitely there to help with easy, beautiful, simple things like this. Absolutely. And if you have this handout, you should be able to scan it and scan the QR and you should be able to go right over to this protocol if you're looking for that. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Zacharia, well, I can't, like, what did you just do in the last 45 minutes? Like, that's crazy. Well done and well thought through. And I am so thankful that you are here on earth helping all of us prescribers um, really dig into this a little bit more. And I don't know about you all, but I have a tremendous amount of questions for you. And we're not going to take time to do that now because you're not here. But we are going to be tomorrow, 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific. We're going to do a live Q&A on Instagram about this whole subject. And you know what? Anything else you want to talk about. Um, so we look forward to seeing you there for sure. Absolutely. Well, if you're listening to all this, and especially if this is new, and maybe you're even new to learning about herbs and nutrients and nutrition, let this digest. 
pun intended. And <laughs> come join us live with all the questions. And I want to hear your feedback and your thoughts as well. And if you are not already on the full script platform, you go ahead and use this QR code at the end of your deck to uh, get on there to access it. And I encourage you again, just go and you know, kind of bounce around in there, check it out and come join us live and happy to answer any questions that you have. Yeah. And don't be intimidated by not knowing how to say her name because that's exactly what we're going to go through first when we see you on Instagram. If okay? you join us live, I have a fun story. For you. Yes. It's a really fun story. <laughs> come on over. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much for, for, for being here. The content was amazing. Thank you all for watching and we hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you, Holly. And thanks for everybody. All the clinicians are out there working so hard. I appreciate you. I see you. Thank you.